Okay, let's get this one straight. The water effects from your video game is not CFD. You know, I have seen some people claim to have CFD capabilities when it was just a free, extremely limited program that they downloaded from the internet. In contrast, one of the most powerful actual CFD programs currently in use today is actually an open source program and it's widely used in academic and commercial circles. So when you hear the word CFD, what are the different methods available and how do they compare? CFD is a whole ecosystem of different mathematics, methodologies, all combining together. The easiest way to classify this is with five different categories. So first off, you've got your mathematics, then you've got your dimensions, your time domain, your turbulence, and then your motions. And how you stack it all up together decides on how simple or how complicated your simulation can be. You can go all the way from a simple little desktop application that solves in 30 seconds to an extremely complicated application that requires a massive computer cluster. First off, let's talk about mathematics. You have two major options here. The first one is the boundary element method, also called panel codes. These are extremely fast. You can solve these in about 30 seconds. So the cost to run these programs is extremely cheap. These require potential flow theory, so you're completely disregarding viscosity. That means there are sections of your problem that you have to completely exclude from your calculations. That means you have to start applying some interesting meshing characteristics and some unique adaptations. These were around in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, back before computers got powerful. The mathematicians came up with some very interesting workarounds to solve the problems at the time, but that did mean a lot of approximations and assumptions. So very fast and still very useful if you're doing preliminary studies or optimizations, but I wouldn't really recommend them for final design options. If you're looking for something a little more robust, the next option up is the finite volume method, what we're also called RANS codes. These do require quite a bit longer to calculate. You're talking more powerful computers, taking 30 minutes to eight hours to run a sim simulation now, but it does give you a lot more control over the solution accuracy. Rather than just meshing the edges of your, your domain, you're now meshing the entire volume of it in as well. This makes the finite volume method an excellent general purpose tool. When most people talk about CFD, this is actually the normal baseline that they're talking about when they say CFD. So this is your normal entry point for CFD prices, is this finite volume method. The next question you have to consider is dimensions. Are we talking 2D or 3D? Obviously, if you want to do simulations in the real world, we need 3D. Most CFD simulations are going to be 3D, three dimensions. However, if you're trying to optimize a specific section shape like a wing section or a truss shape, you can actually go to a 2D section. And that allows you to do a lot of optimization and really work very quickly and very cheaply to do a lot of iterations. So 2D is useful when you're trying to get the detailed performance characteristics for a single component or other element or cross section. So again, we're talking trusses, wing sections, rudders, control fins, that kind of thing. What's really useful is when you combine 2D simulations with 3D simulations. Next up, we have the time domain. This isn't really something you get to pick yourself. It's going to probably be dictated by the physics of whatever you're trying to simulate. Steady simulations are steady state. They're sort of the normal simulation. They're shorter, where we don't really have anything that changes with time. You're just looking at steady flow characteristics. So that's constant velocity flow in a pipe or a ship traveling at a steady velocity, a car traveling at a constant speed, those types of things. And that's your normal case for normal cost. Then we have unsteady cases. That's going to be much longer. Uh, typically we actually have to first run a steady case to get our initialization condition. And then we have to run the unsteady case to find out what's actually changing with time. 
takes extra labor to do all of that. There's now also an extra dimension to check. Uh, CFD operators have to check the quality of resolution in their mesh in all three dimensions. Well, that dimensional resolution also applies to the fourth dimension, time. So they have to check that as well. So it's about 50% extra cost compared to a steady case. How much extra? That really depends how long of a time domain you're trying to simulate. And your CFD operator can tell you about that. The physics really are what drives the cost for time domain. There's also a third option for time domain that a lot of people don't think about, which is cyclic time domain. This happens for things that are on a repetitive cycle. Things like propellers, engines, turbines. In these cases, we can actually use cyclic motion where the simulation itself doesn't actually move, doesn't actually vary with time. And what we actually do is we take the, the net effect of that rotational motion and we apply it as an additional velocity term into the simulation. And that's really nice because you don't actually have to deal with the unsteady effects. It just gets added in as its own extra velocity. It saves you a lot of effort. And so that's not much extra cost than a steady simulation. Be sure to ask about that if you're dealing with something that's rotating. Turbulence. This is the big question in CFD. If you weren't really sure what's going to differentiate the different types of CFD methods out there, the different types of CFD softwares, it's turbulence. Turbulence makes all the difference in terms of price. One option that a lot of people overlook is laminar. This is not something you're going to use when you're trying to get an accurate solution. This is something you'll use for preliminary cases at high Reynolds number situations where you're trying to just run a lot of fast iterations. So you'll separate out the turbulent viscosity and calculate that as its own separate component. You'll be doing that as a hand calculation. And then the CFD simulation is just going to do laminar viscosity on its own. Again, I would only do that at high Reynolds numbers and only for preliminary simulations. Let's get into the cases where turbulence actually matters. In that case, you're going to RANS, LES, DES, or DNS. Those are the big boys. And this is what we're really starting to talk about when we really talk about CFD. The first option up is RANS, Reynolds Averaged Navier-Stokes Equations. You see, turbulence happens just too quickly. You would need time steps on the orders of picoseconds to model it accurately. And the computer powerful enough to accurately model that just flat out doesn't exist. It's not that we can't buy it, it just doesn't exist. It hasn't been made. So instead, Rands came up with the idea of trying to find some mathematics to come up with the average effects of turbulence. We're not trying to track every single picosecond, we're just trying to find out what the average effect is of all those picoseconds. Think of it like the lights in your house. You know that the electricity in your house is cycling really, really fast. The electricity in the wires is actually cycling at 60 hertz if you're in the US, 50 hertz if you're over in Europe. Well, you don't see your lights cycling that fast. All you see is the average brightness in your house. Same thing for RANs. To get that average effect, there are various turbulence models available. You don't really have to worry about that. That's what the engineer deals with. RANs is currently the mainstream method of CFD modeling, and it works pretty well when you're talking streamlined objects. Things like cars, trains, boats, ships, planes, pretty much anything that's meant to move, RANS has solutions for that. They've been working on this for quite a few decades now and they're pretty good at it. I would say this is again right about on the average of what you're expecting when you say a typical cost for CFD. Now let's take a step up. Let's go to the LES DES methods. A lot of the engineers started to find out that the RANS methods were not working for all scenarios. A lot of applications, especially like offshore structures, industrial buildings, uh, especially cylinders, circular objects with flow running across them, those were having troubles. The turbulence models were not working correctly. And the reason for that was because we were just ignoring all turbulence and forgetting it. And really, you need to look at turbulence and realize that there are different scales of turbulence. There are small little eddies, little tiny circles that we can ignore, but then there are actually larger eddies that do influence the flow patterns and we need to capture those. Enter large eddy simulations, capture the large eddies. And so those are where we are going now. These are quite a bit more complicated. 
Their goal is to not ignore all of the turbulence. They want to actually capture and model those larger scale eddies, but still replace the micro scale eddies with a turbulence model. Unfortunately, you don't get this added math for free. This is quite a bit higher cost than Rand's methods. I would say about 100% higher cost. And it gets worse the higher your Reynolds numbers go. Reynolds number is a non-dimensional number to characterize the speed of whatever your object is. The faster you move, the more expensive your large eddy simulation is going to be. And remember, this is a non-dimensional number. So for those of you in the shipping world, I actually have to say sorry. Uh, Non-dimensionally, you're considered to be very fast. So ships, uh, large eddy simulation is incredibly expensive actually. This is actually why they tried to do detached eddy simulation to try and cut back on some of that cost. It tried to use a regular RANS approach near the object where most of the mesh is concentrated and then use the large eddy approach uh, away from the object where you've got less of your mesh. It works somewhat, but you still pay a fairly high cost. So it helps, but you're not getting it for free. These methods, I would say, don't go to them just because they sound great. Only go to them if you have a definite reason to go there. And again, that's you're looking at applications like offshore structures, industrial buildings, cylinders, specifically cylinders. If you have things like waves going around a cylinder, pilings, that type of thing. LES and DES are definitely something you want to consider, but be ready to pay an extra price for it. The last turbulence modeling method is DNFs, direct numerical simulation. There are no simplifications to the Navier-Stokes equations. This should throw up a lot, an alarm bell for you. Remember how I said that there are no real practical applications for modeling turbulence directly. You would need time steps on the order of picoseconds and the computer, full, the computer powerful enough for this just flat out doesn't exist right now. That's what direct numerical simulation is, is they're actually trying to do that. And yeah, there really is no commercial application for that yet. There have been a few academic cases of people trying to do that, where they're really picking an extremely tiny problem to try, to try and do this just to prove that it can be done. So this is mostly in a warning and an alarm bell. If vendors offer to do this for you, to say, I am so good, I can do a direct numerical simulation for you, run, just run, they're lying. As you can tell, we're now into the high end of the CFD spectrum. The last thing you can do is add motion to your body, your object, whatever it is. This actually requires you to morph the mesh of the simulation. Remember that the mesh is the thing that we put around our object to allow the, to define the fluid around our body. And there are several different ways that you can have motion. The very first option, which is the typical option, is you can have no motion. This is the cheapest of the options. The next one is a prescribed motion, where you're describing a mechanical motion. You actually know what the motion is, you tell the simulation and that's not too bad. Um, it gives the simulation a lot to work with and it's not too bad in terms of stability, but it still does add a fair amount to the cost. So you're looking at about 20% extra. And then the last option is DFBI. DFBI stands for Dynamic Fluid Body Interaction. This is pedigree. This is top of the line for CFD, where we are actually getting interactions between the motion of the body and the simulation and solution of the flow around the body. Those two actually feed back on each other. I have done this personally for solid body motion of a ship actually moving as a single solid body. What happens is the computer first solves for flow and pressure around the object, what we call the body. That's just our generic term for it. That determines the body motion. You know, it adds up all the pressure to get the force that gets your motion. Then that body motion feeds back into the flow pattern because the flow physics is aware that, okay, my body is now moving. That has an effect on the flow patterns. That can be highly unstable, not to mention the fact that I'm also changing the shape of my mesh as I go. So definitely expect that to add cost. Time to wrap things up. So if you look at this table, this is a generic comparison of how all of these different CFD methods 
stack up together. The blue line across the middle is basically your baseline. When somebody says CFD, this is what I think of as your baseline for CFD. Finite volume, 3D dimensions, steady state, ran simulation with no mesh motion. And then you can see how you can go up in each one of those categories and the rough increase in cost that would happen for each one of those. Now the catch is, if you start going up in multiple categories, it's not necessarily uh, purely additive. If I were to say, add on on steady motion and dynamic fluid body interaction, DFBI, that's not exactly 50% plus 50% there might be an additional compounding factor in there, so it might add up to an additional 120%. That's one of those things you have to talk with your CFD engineer about, and a lot of it really turns into what is your particular problem. But this table gives you a general idea of what you should expect, and most importantly now, this gives you the tools so that the next time somebody says, I can do CFD, you are properly armed, to cock your eyebrow at them and come back and say, oh really, which CFD? Thanks very much. I'm Nick the Naval Architect. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more videos. And did you know that we produce more than just videos at DMS? Check out our website to find more articles, free downloads, and other help with ship design. We offer a host of engineering services for budgets large and small. So check us out to see if we can make your next project easier.